Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the definition of a ring. Okay, so, in this next video what I now want to do is give you some examples of rings, and all the examples that I'm going to show you are actually going to be examples of commutative rings. Okay, so the first and foremost example of a commutative ring, okay, indeed the prototype for all of ring theory, is the ring of integers. Okay, so let me discuss this for a moment. Okay, so firstly, let's start off with the set that underlies this algebraic structure. Okay, so the set is the set of all the symbols for the whole numbers. Okay, so we'll have 0 here, we'll have 1, we'll have negative 1, we'll have 2, we'll have negative 2, we'll have 3, we'll have negative 3, and on and on it goes. You put in all the positive, all the negative whole numbers, and of course you've also got 0 in there. And that's going to be the set of symbols that is going to actually form this algebraic structure. Okay, then on top of this, what you do is you define an addition law, so you can add any two integers together. So I'll just draw a little picture for the addition composition law. Okay, so here we are. Here's its great big table, and you'll put all the integers up here, so you'll give them all a column. You'll put all the integers down here, you'll give them all the row, and in here, defined is the answer to what any two integers added together is, and it's the normal sense of the word added. Okay, so for instance, 2 plus 3 is 5, the normal addition that you learned years and years ago. Okay, so there's our great big addition composition table, and that does obey the axioms of an abelian group. So let me just get back up the axioms of an abelian group, and let's check that. So firstly, closure. Okay, so if we add any two whole numbers together, I hope you agree that you do end up with another whole number. You don't end up with a symbol outside of my set. Okay, so you don't end up, for instance, with a uh, fraction, and you don't end up with uh, some, you know, irrational number like the square root of 2 or pi. Okay, whenever you add any two integers, whenever you add any two whole numbers together, you do end up with another whole number. Okay, so all the answers in my great big addition table are going to be back within the set. Okay, uh, it does obey associativity. When you add three uh, integers together, you it do doesn't matter where you put the brackets, okay? It has one and only one answer. It really does not matter where you put the brackets. We do have an additive identity, which is zero. Um, okay, and zero does add to any other integer to give that other integer back again, either way around that you do it. We do have additive inverses, because for any integer, you have the negative integer, which will add to it to give zero. Okay, and again, I will stress the point that there is no such thing as subtraction. That is not a composition law in its own right. It's just adding additive inverses. Okay, so sub scrap subtraction. Scrap viewing subtraction as a separate composition law. It's just adding additive inverses now. Okay, so indeed all elements in the uh, integers do have a negative integer which can uh, they can add uh, to to give the additive identity back again. And for the additive identity itself, zero, you might think, well, there's no negative zero, but of course the uh, inverse of zero is zero itself. Zero will add to zero to give zero. Okay, but for all other integers, so for instance 5, you'll have negative 5, and if you add 5 and negative 5 together, either way round, you'll get 0 back again. So that's all good. And of course, it does obey commutativity. It really does not matter which way round you add two things together. 5 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 5. Okay, and that goes whatever two integers you selected. So, this addition composition table then does obey the axioms of an abelian group. So this is looking hopeful, so addition's doing fine. Now let's think about the multiplication composition table. So we can multiply any two integers together. Okay, so once again, in the table, you'll put all the integers up here, you'll give every single integer a column, and you'll put all the integers down here, you'll give every single integer a row, and then you'll go through and define what any two integers multiplied together is equal to, and that's exactly uh, the normal way that we would multiply two integers together. So 2 times 3 is 6, for instance. OK, and let's check now that this does obey the axioms then that a commutative ring needs to obey. Okay, so getting back up the axioms, so axiom number one then 
is that it needs to be closed. So whenever we multiply two integers together, we need to make sure that we get another symbol back within the set of integers. Okay, hopefully that again is intuitive to you, that when you multiply two whole numbers together, you don't end up with some symbol outside the whole numbers. You don't end up with a fraction, and you don't end up uh, with some irrational number. You do end up with one of the symbols that you've got in that set back again. Okay, so it is closed under multiplication. Multiplication does obey associativity. It really does not matter where you put the brackets. If you multiply three things together, it has one and only one answer. We do have a multiplicative identity, which indeed is called one. One will multiply with any other integer to give uh, that other integer back again, either way around that you do it. Distributivity is true. Okay, so we know that if you do have an expression like this in the whole numbers, it working in the integers, it is true either way around. So left and right distributivity, intuitively from your knowledge of classical algebra, you should hopefully know that these two things are true when you're multiplying and adding uh, integers. And finally, it does obey commutativity. So when you multiply two integers together, uh, it doesn't matter which way round you do it. Okay, now, that was not a formal proof of any of this. I am not going to go through the formal construction of the integers from Piano's axioms. You can go through a formal construction of the integers, but I hope that your uh, intuitive view of the integers from classical algebra, from what you learnt in school, uh, is good enough that we don't need to go through that. Okay, so the integers uh, is a uh, example of a commutative ring, then. It's the prototypical example of a commutative ring. Okay, now, uh, the other thing that I'm going to say at this stage, and we are going to see lots of other examples of rings uh, later on in this playlist, but at this stage, all I want to say as another example of a ring uh, is all the fields. Okay, so all the fields that we have already seen. Uh, so, uh, for instance, the rational numbers, the real numbers, the complex numbers, uh, and all the prime fields that we saw in the playlist on vector spaces, all of those are commutative rings, okay, because all of the axioms that we've seen, addition being an abelian group, multiplication, obeying all of those axioms of a commutative ring, those are all axioms that you insist are true for a field. In a field, you just add the additional criterion on that you want all uh, non-zero elements in the field to have a multiplicative inverse. Okay, so a field is just a commutative ring plus an additional amazing criterion that you're going to insist that all elements bar the additive identity in the field have a multiplicative inverse. So indeed, all fields are commutative rings, they've just got an additional criterion on, okay, that makes them even more special. But they are all commutative rings. It wouldn't be wrong to say that if you've got the rational numbers, for instance, with addition and multiplication defined on it, that that uh, obeys the axioms of a commutative ring. It does obey the axioms of a commutative ring. It just um, obeys an additional axiom on top of all those axioms, which makes it even better, and therefore we classify it as a field more normally. Okay, so all fields then that we've seen in the playlist on vector spaces, those are other examples of commutative rings. Okay, now, uh, one final example. I lied saying that we weren't going to have another example. We do have one final example. Okay, and the final example that I want to talk about is the zero ring, which is a really stupid ring. This is the only ring, I mentioned it earlier, this is the only ring where the additive identity and the multiplicative identity are the same element in the ring. In all other rings, the additive identity cannot be the multiplicative identity. Okay, so the zero ring is nice because you can write it out very easily on a piece of paper. It contains a single element, and you can call this element whatever you like, but I'll call it zero. Okay, and the addition law on this is going to be really simple. It's just going to be 0 plus 0 is going to give 0. So there's my addition composition table. I'll just colour this in. Okay, so here's the set. Here's the addition composition table. And that is an abelian group. It's ridiculously trivial, but that is an abelian group. Okay, and then we're going to have a multiplication table. And the only multiplication that we can possibly do is 0 multiplied by 0. And the answer, again, is going to have to be 0. Okay, if we're going to insist that this has to obey closure, uh, then of course, it's going to have to be zero, because there's only one element of the set it can be equal to. 
Okay, so there is our addition and multiplication laws, and this does actually stupidly obey all of the axioms of uh, ring theory. It obeys all of the axioms of a commutative ring. Okay, now in this ring, this zero ring as it's called, the additive identity and the multiplicative identity are the same, because zero is both the additive identity, it adds to everything to give that thing back again, and it's also the multiplicative identity, it multiplies with everything to give that thing back again. Okay, so in the zero ring, zero is the multiplicative identity as well as being the additive identity. However, I claim that if you make your ring bigger than a ring that just contains one element, the instant you have more than one element in your ring, it will instantly be the case that the additive identity cannot be the multiplicative identity. And the reason is, I can show this very simply by just imagining extending up my multiplication table here. If I put in another element into this ring, okay, so if I have another element, I'll just give it the arbitrary symbol x, then I know in a ring, the additive identity zero has to multiply by anything to give zero, okay? And that's no longer consistent with this being the multiplicative identity. The additive identity, if zero is the additive identity in my ring here, it cannot also be the multiplicative identity now that I've got more than one element in. Because look, it has to multiply by x to give zero, but if it was the multiplicative identity, it would have to give x here. The answer would have to be equal to x. So the instant you have more than one element in your ring, the properties of the additive identity cannot be consistent with the properties of the multiplicative identity. Okay, so the additive identity cannot equal the multiplicative identity in any ring except the zero ring, because the instant you put in another element, you have this problem that zero, the additive identity, must multiply by with it to give zero, but it can no longer be the multiplicative identity, because if it was the multiplicative identity, the answer here would have to be x. Okay, so the instant you have more than one element in your ring, the additive and multiplicative identities cannot be the same elements in that ring. This is the only case where 0 and 1 are equal to one another. In all other rings, 0 and 1 are two distinct elements of the rings and the ring, and we will give them those symbols. We'll give the additive identity the symbol 0 and the multiplicative identity the symbol 1. Okay, so that is an important point to just uh, discuss. Okay, so the final thing that I want to discuss in this video is to give you the definition of a subring. Okay, so this is very much so analogous to the concept of a subgroup from group theory and the concept of uh, a subspace from vector spaces. Okay, so a subring then is a subset of the elements of your ring capital R. So we'll start off with S, which is going to be our subring, and it starts off its life as a subset of the larger ring capital R. Okay, so here this box can represent the larger ring capital R here. So I'll colour it in in turquoise here. And then what we're going to start off with is some subset of our ring here. Okay, uh, so we'll highlight it up in orange here. And in order to be a subring, that subset with the restricted addition and multiplication laws on it has to be a ring in its own right. Okay, so what do I mean by the restricted addition and multiplication laws? Okay, so if I draw a little picture here, let's say this is my addition law, and this is my multiplication law. Now, these laws at present give you the answer as to what any element of the ring added or multiplied to any other element of the ring is. I'm now only interested in elements of my subset S being added or multiplied with elements of my subset S. Okay, so let's say that this, these rows here are the rows corresponding to the subset S. Okay, let's say that these columns here are the columns corresponding to the subset S. Okay, so I'm actually now only interested in this sub-portion of this composition table where I've got elements of the subset S being added to elements of the subset S. I'm not interested in all the rest here, which is elements, which is involving elements of the ring outside of the subset S. So I want to get rid of all of this portion of the addition composition table. This sub-portion of the addition composition table, which relates to the subset S, that's what I mean by the addition composition law restricted down to the subset S. And you can do the same thing for multiplication.
Okay, now if this subset S with the restricted addition and multiplication laws on it is a ring in its own right, okay, then it's called a subring, okay? So, two trivial examples of a subring. Firstly, there will always be the zero ring inside any ring, which is a subring. So, you can just take the subset that contains only the additive identity in your ring, and if you restrict down the addition and multiplication laws, it will become these laws that I've just shown you here, because we know that zero added to itself in any ring will give zero, and zero multiplied by itself in any ring will give zero. So, the zero ring is always a subring of any ring. And the other subring that you can always find in any ring is the entire ring itself. Okay, I didn't say that this had to be a proper subset, it just has to be a subset of it. So you can take the subset which is the entire ring, and of course then you don't bother restricting the addition and multiplication laws down at all, uh, and you'll just end up with the exact same structure that you started off with, and that's another example of a trivial subring. So those are the two trivial subrings, the zero subring and the entire ring itself. Okay, any uh, subring that isn't one of those trivial ones is then called a proper subring, in the same way that we have proper subgroups and proper subspaces uh, from group theory and vector spaces. Okay, so uh, we will use that definition in uh, upcoming videos in this playlist. Okay, so just to introduce it here and now. Okay, so there we will end this discussion on the definition of a ring.